Thanks, Will. That was an exceedingly generous introduction. And it's going to be very hard to follow that fabulous talk from the students. I think uh, it's the best student talk I've ever heard. <laughs> I have a favor to ask everybody, though. Um, I know it's not typical for graduations, but I have to ask that no photographs be taken. Because I'm wearing a red tie in honor of the Danes, but I've just recently been hired by Berkeley. And if I'm photographed wearing Stanford colors, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, it's very funny to come back to Fountain Valley. The graduates don't know it yet. But if 37 years from now you're back like I am today, lots of memories will be triggered. And the funny thing is that like with siblings, when you come back, some things trigger and make you feel 17 again. For me, it was last night when I opened the screen and out flew this cloud of Miller moths. <laughs> I was like, where's my bowl of soapy water on the light focusing down into it? <laughs> so I, um, yesterday morning, I was driving my daughter to school on my way to the airport. And she's 15. And like you guys, I'm sure, likes to give her dad advice. A week ago, I had my first graduation as dean at Berkeley. And the morning, she says, dad, please, don't do anything inappropriate. <laughs> She said, mom's away. Imagine she's sitting next to you, ready to kick your shin when you're thinking about doing one of those things. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep that advice in mind today. And she said to me yesterday, she says, what are you going to talk to Fountain Valley about? And I said, you know, I think I'm going to talk to them about sin. <laughs> she looked at me like I was completely nuts. Because <laughs> truth be told, on the spectrum of how religious people are, I'm pretty much at that extreme non-religious end of the spectrum. But the problem is, like, how many times in your life do you get the chance to stand up and preach if you're not a preacher? So, <laughs> so you, you got to take advantage of it. <laughs> so I thought sin would be a good topic for today. <laughs> and the reason I thought of sin was because it was back when I was first getting involved in AIDS. I spent most of my life working on AIDS. And I went to my first international AIDS conference, and it was 1988, and it was in Stockholm. And I went to this session that was about religious leaders and the epidemic. And as you can imagine, the relations with various churches has been a complex one in trying to address this epidemic. And there was a Catholic priest up on the stadium, on the stage, and he said, that he didn't want anybody to think that he was a sin accountant because there was a lots of controversy about the Catholic Church and condoms. And he said, I don't want anyone to call me a sin accountant, but if there's a choice between the sin of using a condom and the sin, if you're HIV infected, of having sex with somebody and infecting them with HIV, there's no question which is the lesser sin. So in that case, please use a condom. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, it's interesting, I never thought about sin accounting before, but I mean, it turns out, for any of you who've grown up at all in the Catholic Church, obviously if I was going to talk about sin today, the nuns in my youth obviously had more of an effect than I thought. But in fact, the Catholic Church has this wonderful thing. If you go into confession and you tell the priest what you've done bad, he'll weigh that and give you some penance, which will balance it out, and then you'll be neutral again, and you get to wipe all those sins away. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Any of you who are in a different religion should try it. Right? <laughs> it's, it's incredibly powerful, right? Whoosh. Um, so, but I, th I thought to myself, listen, um, sins aren't just the big bad ones, right? Because we all hear we're all sinners, right? I have to say, I always thought to myself, you know, I'm not lying or cheating or stealing or killing. I'm not cheating on my wife. so. Maybe you are. <laughs> but it turns out that what I want to talk about today in terms of sin is the really broad concept of sin. It's not just the ones that are in the Ten Commandments. So all of us got here today. Some of us came from far away. I came from San Francisco. People, I'm sure, came from much further away than that. I spent about 650 pounds of CO2 coming here. 
Okay? Now, from my perspective, that's a sin. It's a sin in the sense that I took something from the world and I didn't give anything back, so therefore I have a debt in the sin balance column, right? Now, how could I pay that debt back? Well, I could pay it back directly by planting trees or you know, contributing to somebody who's sequestering CO2 in a cave somewhere. But <laughs> I'd like to think that, in fact, we can be more flexible about how we pay back our sins. You don't have to pay back the direct sin. You could think of it more like a market economy. You know, a cobbler makes shoes, sells shoes, uses the money to buy food. So think of the sin economy, right? So in that case, I could do other good things that would give back to the world that would compensate for my 650 pounds of CO2. So I could tutor kids in the boys club, or I could build stone steps on a mountain trail that would enable people to reach the wilderness. Or I could contribute to family planning programs in Bangladesh and the Sahel, which is the part of Africa just under the Sahara. And why do I mention those two? Well, because it turns out that People here are not going to suffer much for my 650 pounds, but Bangladesh is about the size of Arkansas, and the whole thing is basically one big New Orleans. It's all a river delta. So most of Bangladesh lies less than 12 meters above sea level. So that's less than where we're sitting compared to the pond in the lower pasture, right? That's most of the country. And into that little piece of Arkansas, sit 150 million people. It's the most densely populated country in the world. So they're going to really suffer from my 650 pounds of CO2 in a way that none of us will. And why do I mention the Sahel? Because the Sahel is the region with the world's highest fertility, seven child, children per woman on average. And it's the driest, most miserable place in the world to grow crops. And it's where the population is growing the fastest. So an initial degree or two of, of global warming puts them out of the food production business, mass starvation. So if we're going to pay back that global warming, that'd be a good place to start. Now, for those of you who aren't, you know, weren't as influenced by the nuns when you were young, you might think about a different analogy. It's more appropriate for Colorado, I think. It's the potluck analogy. So think of life as one huge potluck. And what's the cardinal rule of a potluck? You don't eat more than you bring, right? <laughs> That's the cardinal rule of a potluck. You don't eat more than you bring. Now, you don't have to eat what you bring. That's the great thing about a potluck. It's like a market economy, right? <laughs> you can bring the dessert and eat the salad, or bring the salad and eat the dessert. But you don't get to go to a potluck and eat without bringing, right? And the basic rule is, if you're going to bring a family of six people, you bring enough food for six people, and then it all works out. Right? So that's what life is like. For me, that's the same thing as the sin balance. It's the giant potluck of life. You're not supposed to eat more than you bring. So that applies not just to the environment, not just to the carbon dioxide and the people in the Sahel. It applies to everything we do, work, live, play, vacation, whatever. So I spent 11 years living in Mexico, recently moved back to the US. And the number one killer, the number one cause of disability in Mexico is diabetes. And Mexico is now more obese than the United States. We used to have the honor of being the world's most obese place, but now it's been overtaken by Mexico. And in Mexico, some 16, 17% of all calories <clears throat> come from soda, soft drinks. Mexicans, on average, drink 43 gallons of soda pop every year. And now they lead the world in death, or they lead uh, diabetes leads in terms of death and disability in the country. It turns out that 65% of the soda in Mexico comes from Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And when I was in Mexico for Christmas last year, this year, no, last year, a little confused, <laughs> it's been a long week, <laughs> um, the country, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Mexico for Christmas, but every village, every town, every city has a huge Christmas tree in the town square covered with red balls. It's the Coca-Cola Christmas tree. And every television and every movie theater, and I went over Christmas to the movies, has these fabulously, beautifully done, wholesome ads with Santa Claus selling Coca-Cola to Mexican children. So when I was here, I went to school, actually, with the child of the, one of the first Marlboro men. 
And in 1971, we stopped the tobacco industry from advertising cigarettes on television because it's a bad thing to sell bad things to children, right? But we're very much doing that with the things that are causing the biggest cause of death and disability in Mexico. Now, why do I mention all that? I mention all that because after you go to college and get out into the world, it's not just the CO2 that you produce, it's the net balance of what you do for the world and what the world does for you. So if you market Coca-Cola to children, then you gotta do a whole lot of good stuff. Because that's bad, right? And the problem is it's unlike the tobacco industry, you don't know that it's bad because the food industry, the entire spectrum from the really virtuous, right? People who feed people, that's a really good thing. To people who sell, to people who bribe children with toys so that they'll buy more chicken McNuggets, fries, and Cokes, right? That's not a good thing. So that entire spectrum, you gotta figure out in whatever you do, in your play, in your work, the things that you do that add to the sin burden, how are you going to offset them? You can't come to the potluck and just eat all, you know, run there first, eat all the chocolate covered strawberries and not bring anything. That's not okay, right? So how are you going to work out that balance? And most of us, all of us, we take every day. So let's take the financial sector. You know, at the virtuous end of it, you know, you got the angels, the angels that are doing microcredit schemes for women in villages in India who are manufacturing sanitary napkins so that girls can actually go to school when they have their periods, right? Then you have the virtuous end of the spectrum. People like Greg Osborne, who gives money to small people in construction to build homes so that we have more homes for people who need them in this country. And then we have the people who are kind of neutral because there are rich people gambling with their money against other rich people and it's sort of like fantasy football but with big money and, and stocks and bonds and it's okay because they all know the rules and they're all playing by their own rules. And then you have the people at the rapacious end of the spectrum and that's a great SAT word I learned here from John Munger in English <laughs> class. They're the people who are gambling with poor people's houses and pensions and jobs and healthcare and led to the crash in 2008, those people have a whole lot of food to bring to the potluck. A lot of food. Because they ate way too much. Now, um, you can guess where this is going. <laughs> um, and the thing is that it turns out that when you get to be 18, everybody has had people bringing food to their potluck for 18 years and that's normal and appropriate. So I'm not gonna guilt trip anybody sitting on this stage because you have, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. But what I want you to realize is that unlike most other 18 year olds in the world, you've had more food at the potluck than most people have. You've gotten a great deal and you won't recognize it yet. You just said some really nice things, but believe me, 37 years from now, it'll look a whole lot better than it does today. You won't realize that you may go on for a lot of school after this. I mean, I graduated from here in 77, I got my last degree in 96. So I had a ridiculous amount of years of school afterwards. I didn't learn in all those other years of school anywhere near as much important stuff as I learned in the four years I was here at Fountain Valley. You know, I learned, I learned to speak and not be afraid of getting up in a crowd from Chris Lowell, who's sitting here, who took a chance on me in a play. Um, I learned to think from some people who actually, this has been a bad year for Fountain Valley. Um, John Munger died, my English teacher, Chuck Warren, my, my physics teacher, um, Don Cardock, the athletic director. Um, but John, Mar John Patton and Jim Mariner are here in the audience. They taught me how to think along with those guys who are no longer with us. Um, you won't recognize how important that is until you realize how little you learn from now on. <laughs> <laughs> So, Will mentioned that at the 75th, 75th anniversary of the school, I was, I was honored. I was very honored for my service. And the thing I want to tell you is that I, I've had the luxury of working on some pretty good things. But in that balance of sin and of give and get, I've gotten as good as I've given. I've had a charmed life. 
I got to go to Fountain Valley. I didn't just get to ride at Fountain Valley. I got to have a horse, my own horse at Fountain Valley. In fact, I got to have two because I brought a filly to, to train her while I was here. Um, people I talk to now, they can't believe that. They think that it sounds like some shake or something. <laughs> I went to my first choice school. I, I've had a series every single time of exactly the job that I want. I've lived in great places. I've been paid really well. I've been paid obscenely well for what I do. Um, doctors do in this country. My wife, I happen to marry one, so that's even better, right? So <laughs> anyone who thinks that I've been giving more than I've been getting is wrong, right? The people that really deserve to be honored are those who give a lot more than they get, right? And it turns out those people are not hard to find. And sometimes, sometimes we don't have to look any further than what's right in front of us. And the people who've been standing in front of you for the last 12 years of your education, they've been giving a lot more than they're getting. Now that'll stop today, because you'll go on and you'll go to university where, believe me, the professors are a lot better paid. And then you'll work with people throughout your whole life, and you will believe what some of them are paid for the work that they do. So when you're thinking about that balance of yours, years down the road, when you're thinking about how am I doing on the give-get balance, think about the people who for the last 12 years have been standing in front of you. So I want to finish by asking you guys for a rousing Fountain Valley style cheer, not yet, for all those people who've been standing in front of you for the last 12 years. And I want you to think about the six words the six words, if they're really six, did I count them right? <laughs> Don't eat more than you bring. Thank you very much.